So hello everyone, welcome back to the second session of AWS series. Before starting today's session, uh, yesterday I have asked few of you to create a free tier account. For those who have already created, there is one very important step that is setting up your billing just to avoid any accidental cost. So let's quickly first see how you can do that and then we will jump to our architecture session. First of all, you need to go to AWS management console. The link is aws.amazon.com or you can directly Google it. Now on the top right, sign into the console. So if you have already created the account, I'm assuming that you have only registered and have not created any IAM user and you'll be following along with me. Right now, as an initial step, we need to log in as a root user, enter your email, which you use to register the free tier account. Next, password and sign in. Quickly, let's explore. On the top right, you'll see your account name, which you provided while creating the account, under which you can see your account ID, followed by many options like account organization, billing dashboard, security credentials, and then settings and sign out. As an initial step, we are going to explore billing dashboard and we'll be setting our billing alarms. This should be the first step that you have to do. Go to billing dashboard. On the left pane, go to budgets. Now create a budget. Don't worry, this is not going to cost you, but there is still a limit on how many budgets you want to create. But for learning purpose, if you create one or two, that falls under free tier. Let this be checked, simplified on the templates. Let's make it a monthly cost budget. You can give a name to your budget, demo budget. And here you have to enter the dollar amount that you want your bill to be limited to. I'll limit it to say $5 because first we'll be starting with the free tier eligible services. So I'm expecting even this $5 should not start. But once we uh, explore the paid services, in that case, there are chances it will go beyond $5. But as of now, I would suggest you keep it $5. You can specify the email addresses you want uh, to get notified on. If there are multiple separated by commas, and you can see here the message. There will be three instances where you will be notified. That's all. Quickly, let's create the budget. And now we can sit at peace before using any, any of the services, just in case uh, something goes wrong. Another important thing, as we move ahead, we will not be using the root account. No one should be using that. Even for the admin level activities, we'll be doing everything with the admin level of IAM access. We'll come to that in the next session because this first session is going to be totally on AWS architecture. But just to keep in mind, we should not be logging into root account directly. For that, there is one small change that you should also do. You can go to your account and click on the account link and scroll down. Here you can see I am user and role access to billing information. Right now it's deactivated. We want to edit it and activate the IAM access. Make sure you do that. It will make more sense once we get into identity and access based sessions. Click on update and we are done. Now let's start with our architecture related topics. We will have couple of sessions in this bucket and we will cover all the details about the AWS architecture. So for AWS, let's start with understanding two very basic topics of regions and availability zones. So these are very, very foundation level of concepts that everyone needs to know. So let's see what is region first. So here you can see a pictorial representation of a region. There is something written after that US East one. Basically, these regions are the physical geographical locations of the AWS infrastructures. These are spread all across the globe. Now you can notice, as I told this US East one, so these represent different geographical locations where that part of AWS infrastructure lies. There are many regions and every region has a different code, something like this. And corresponding to each code, you can see there are different actual physical locations, geographical locations. Now, the second important topic is availability zones. So a region can be divided into two or more availability zones. These availability zones Keep in mind, they can spread across one or more data centers, data centers, which you have heard multiple times, the actual servers or server towers, but all those data centers have to be in a particular region. Data center is a physical thing, but virtually this division is done based on different availability zones inside a region. So physical systems may be data centers and these data centers are completely fully equipped with redundant power sources, cooling mechanisms, backup mechanisms, 
but virtually these availability zones are a part of different data centers. One availability zone can spread across more than one data centers as well. So keep that in mind how this actual data center that you have heard, how this availability zone comes into comparison with that. So as I told, there are multiple such regions. As of 2023, there are 31 regions and total 99 availability zones spread across these regions. Now let's understand this pictorially how these regions are connected. Let's consider similar regions. All these regions are connected with a high speed redundant network that is a global backbone of AWS infrastructure. This is the backbone that holds all the services, all the AWS regions together. So that was an overall picture of how regions and availability zones are connected and how to understand their significance once we start working on the AWS platform. Now let's dig a little bit deeper and understand from one region's perspective. Let's consider one region again. Now what apart from these regions AWS provides us? This is very important. So these AWS regions can also be extended out in case someone has their own corporate data center. This can be done with using a service called AWS Outposts where you can set up your subnets and run your instances inside that. Don't worry, we'll come to all this subnet and instances, VPCs, everything. But overall, keep in mind that AWS services through a region can also be extended out to corporate data center in case there is some requirement for on-premise systems. Now, in some special requirements, these AWS regions can be extended physically closer to the end users with a service called AWS local zones, where again, we can set up your uh, services, your subnets and run your instances. So the main purpose of this is to extend the region closer to the end user in case required. Something very similar to AWS local zones is AWS wavelength zones, where the concept is exactly same. Only the difference is these regions or wavelength zones are connected with the AWS region through a high speed 5G network, which are more appropriate for remote services like mobile streaming, ARs, VRs, etc. So these were the extension possibilities, but for some special requirements where some or the other content might be readily reusable. It might not be very optimal to again and again fetch it from region far away, right? Some examples like image files, video files, some short running scripts, just like you can consider an example of Netflix or any video streaming platform. If there is a new movie that is coming out and in any particular area, uh, there are chances many people are going to watch the same movie. So for such required, this was an example, but for such requirements, AWS also provides regional edge caches. So this is one service where the end user base can consume the data, which is repeatedly being uh, used with the lowest latency possible. As of current scenario, based upon the user base and the requirements of uh, the user that wants their content to be on regional caches, the number of these caches uh, keep on expanding. So these are the caches and there are further, they can be extended to edge locations where finally your data is placed and these edge locations can be placed with your area's local providers and these edge locations can be very quickly refreshed with your regional edge caches. In case there is a cache miss, at that point of time, the data might be refreshed from uh, regional edge caches or even if there is a cache miss there, might be there because when there is no other option, it might be uh, fetched from the actual physical region. But at least these regional edge caches and edge locations help to a great extent in reducing the latency for reusable resources. Again, if you uh, say about the numbers, as of today, there are 13 uh, regional edge caches and about more than 400 edge locations that are getting served from these 13 regional edge caches. So this is today's data, but just to give an idea. So that was a bird's eye view of uh, AWS infrastructure, but we will get into more details as we zoom into it in further sessions. So let's discuss rest of it in next session, but overall keep this uh, picture in mind. This will be helpful and make more sense once we start using these services. And hope by now you have all set up your free tier account. See you guys in next session. Thank you guys. And please do subscribe to GK Code Labs and hit that bell icon to never miss any video in this series. You can go to GK Code Labs and click on the playlist. In that, you will find the cloud series. 
you can follow all the videos from there thank you guys see you later